What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lumix Live. Uh, we're going to have uh, basically continuing the same trend that we've been doing for the last couple of weeks because um, the communication and like the conversations that have been going on in the chat have been, you know, super awesome. So I want to keep keep on this kind of trend uh, for, for a little while right now. But uh, yeah, instead of talking about, you know, the cameras or, you know, the, the hardware from that sense, I wanted to take a bit of time and actually just talk about lenses across the board. Um, you know, we've recently completed the F 1.8 series of lenses, uh, that we've announced and actually started shipping now. So that's, uh, in the full frame series, that's the 24 or 18, 24, 35, 50 and 85 millimeter, uh, in the micro four thirds realm, you know, there's pretty much every kind of optic that you could think of available already. Uh, and, and we've gotten a ton of, uh, you know, kind of feedback from all of you over the last couple of weeks uh, is like lenses you'd love to see in the future. So I figured with with that kind of conversation, now is a pretty cool time to, to talk about you know, some of the different technologies, what the differences are between the, the kind of series that are available in Micro Four Thirds as well as in the L mount. So in the S series cameras that we offer uh, and then just kind of go over the, the, the capabilities that you have when you look at either a native Panasonic Lumix lens, especially if you're on micro four thirds or what the L mount brings to the full frame series and how it's actually changing the kind of dynamic that we would traditionally think of when it comes to optics and picking out a lens for your camera system. So, uh, this, these, streams just like every single week they are completely interactive so if you have questions you've got comments make sure to tag us uh, by using at lumix cameras as you can see a few people have been doing that just helps me see it on my side i've wanted to use uh youtube's actual like q a feature but being a single person operating the stream it looked a little more complicated than it's worth uh so we're just going to keep doing it this way um and, and i'm going to be dropping a couple of polls throughout the uh stream so um, I'd love to hear from you uh, with the first poll that we've got up, which is, are you someone who prefers to use zoom lenses or do you prefer to work with prime or fixed focus or fixed focal length lenses? Um, so definitely uh, drop a uh, answer to the poll in there. Um, I'm curious to see how this split kind of plays out by the end. Uh, already I'm a bit surprised. So, uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah. Welcome to this week. Uh, if you're new around here, these are weekly broadcasts that we do every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, so right now, uh, and we do them on a varying level of different topics. So sometimes we'll have guests on board, sometimes we'll have members uh, or other members from Panasonic Lumix here uh, to get really into the technical weeds with some stuff, uh, or we just have an open kind of AMA Q&A session here with everybody so that you have a platform to actually reach out and speak to the brand and not have to go through third party information from someone online that probably doesn't really know the whole story or is just completely off base with some of the commentary that may get made online. So, um, yeah, so feel free to ask, uh, any, any kind of question. Yes, we're talking about lenses, but like always, these can be questions about anything. Um, we like to keep these things relatively casual. So you got questions, ask them and I'll try to answer them for you. Um, before we drop into that, let's talk about Lumix Pro Services. We have Lumix Pro Services available here in the United States, two tiers, red and platinum. I've said this for almost three years at this point, I believe. Uh, red is free, so if you own a Lumix camera or you bought a Lumix camera recently, make sure to follow the link, get yourself registered. It's totally free. Get you that three-year manufacturer warranty extended over the one year that we often uh, that we offer right out of the box uh, here in the U.S. Make that clear. That's, that's the U.S. side of it. Uh, and then there is the platinum tier as well, which gets you an extra level of uh, service and support on the back end. Uh, that gets you discounts on out of warranty repairs. So you get 20% off if something breaks or gets damaged in the field and you need to get it repaired. Uh, you also get two day repairs with free shipping next day uh, for both ways. So if you, you know, basically minimizes any kind of downtime you might have. Uh, if you're someone who prefers to speak to people on the phone instead of working through a chat system or an email, you do have the option in the Platinum tier to have our uh, hotline access. So that's op normal operating business hours on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, and then, yeah, some other cool stuff, you know, annual sensor cleaning, service maintenance, stuff like that. And a pretty cool Peak Design strap that comes as a welcome gift for joining the, the uh, program. 
Uh, if you're joining us outside of the United States, we do have Lumix Pro services available. You can check the link down in the description below, uh, and that will show bring you to the portal of the different countries that are available as of today uh, to get yourself registered and see what's available in your region. So cool. Now that all of that stuff is kind of just out of the way, let's dive into this here. So uh, we've got a couple of people uh, that have jumped in already. Uh, FC, Zoom or Prime Poll, I want to click both. Yeah, uh, I, I was debating like how to actually do this. Uh, figured it's just easier. Just pick, pick the one that you primarily use over the other. Uh, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, for a lot of us, it's really hard to kind of like boil down like which is your preferred out of them because like most uh, situations, it's always going to be job dependent or, you know, feeling dependent. Are you someone who just likes to, you know, kind of narrow down your focus? Again, no pun intended. It's going to be really hard to not, not do that. Um, you know, narrow down the direction that you want to go with the optic for that given day, but you know, we all, we all have some of those lenses that are just like, this is always in the bag. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, DJ Electric says, uh, a bit of a question barrage today. First two, uh, any new power zooms? Uh, two, you know we want them. Uh, yeah. Um, thoughts on abusing the MFT crop to seek new grounds? A 150 to 500 maybe. Uh, so... As far as power zooms go, um, I, I, don't, I don't have any information on any kind of future development of power zooms. I know that like myself and Matt Fraser are big supporters of additional new power zoom lenses to come to the market. Um, I think something that a lot of people that utilize a power zoom lens, and for those that don't know, these are lenses that have the ability to be uh, servo controlled for zoom, but typically they're going to be built in. So you don't have to manually turn the focus ring. You can do it electronically. Um, and there are a lot of options out there from, you know, varying different companies. If you look into the cinema series, there are servo zoom lenses and the broadcast side. There's plenty of them. Well, plenty of them. Uh, but a lot goes into figuring out what's the right focal length to make. What's the most usable f-stop or aperture values that are on these lenses. And a lot of times... If you look at existing power zoom lenses that are that are out there and that have come out into the market, uh, they they fit a very different niche than what mass users probably would be expecting out of a lens. They're usually not as fast, so they're usually not like an f 1.4. They're usually somewhere around like a four or a five six kind of range like that. So um, the thought is definitely there. Um, and as I said, Matt Matt Fraser and I and a, and a number of others I know uh, within the company are definitely supportive of the idea. Um, but it, it does take a lot of research and feedback from the community. So as y'all, you know, kind of have an idea of what power zoom focal lengths you would really love to see, um, definitely always let us know. Can never make any guarantees as those of you that have watched this long enough probably know already. Uh, but that's, that's how we generate and how we develop systems as we move forward is your feedback to us. So yeah. Uh, and then the second part of your question, um, Thoughts on abusing the MFT crop to seek new grounds, a 150 to 500 maybe. Um, I, it definitely would be interesting. Um, and I assume you mean a 150 to 500 in the micro four thirds terms. So actually like a 300 to 600 millimeter in 35 millimeter field of view terms. Um, it, it, ideas like that are always being considered. Um, but I think with a lot of things you do have to look at, again, it's kind of like the power zooms. How often is a lens like that really going to be looked for? Uh, what's the price? What's the weight going to be? Um, what's required to make them, you know, proper in that area? Um, again, it doesn't mean no, uh, but it, it means that it is under consideration uh, across the board. But everything in a business always gets put into different categories, right? It's there's the wants, the needs, and then the required <laughs> So you kind of, those lenses get put into different categories at different times, you know, depending on where the cameras are at the time, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it, it, it would be interesting to see a 150 to 500 millimeter in micro four thirds, which would be, you know, 300 to 600 or 300 to a thousand millimeter. Sorry. I can't believe I got that wrong the first time, but yeah. Uh, Alan says thoughts on adapted telephoto lenses, noise, noise with speed booster and pixel crop versus basic one-to-one -one adapter. Um, adapting telephoto lenses is definitely a really solid way to go. Um, 
you know, I, obviously if you're looking in the, um, different platforms is really what's going to determine where it's really super beneficial versus doing something like a one-to-one -one crop, uh, or a, a one-to-one -one readout on the sensor. Uh, if you're in the, the crop censored cameras, so the micro four thirds platform, um, you do obviously going optic for your zoom and your telephoto reach typically is always the better path to go. Uh, you're doing less of the kind of additional on the top processing for lenses. Uh, you can get typically more reach and you even have more flexibility when you do it that way. Because if you're using, say like, um, I'll use GH6 as an example. If you're using full sensor readout and say you're shooting an open gate and you throw a, you know, 70 to 200, 28 from a full frame camera on there. Well, to start with your 140 to 400 millimeter for your field of view, but you also have the ability then to go in and tell the camera that you want to use a pixel to pixel readout, which gets you even further um, because you're, you're punching in on the sensor for that. So that's one big benefit. Um, it can be costly uh, and you do run into some challenges between you know, what lenses are compatible as far as adapters go for things like focusing or stabilization effects. Um, most times when you adapt a lens to a camera, you end up uh, kind of getting stuck with different levels of stabilization than you would normally experience. So as a good example would be like the 50 to 200 that we have for the Micro Four Thirds platform. Out of the gate, you've got a 100 to 400 millimeter right here. You can get a 2x teleconverter on this guy, which brings you out to a uh, 200 to, or yeah, a 200 to, what is that, 4, 8, 200 to 800 millimeter. Um, I can do math today. Uh, so you you get some benefits by just sticking with, with the native mount, but the biggest thing is that our dual IS system in the Micro Four Thirds platform is compatible on a lens like this, where you end up running into some challenges with adapted lenses, where it's either the optic stabilization is the only thing you get, uh, or you're limited to the in-body stabilization, which the more telephoto you get, the less effective in-body stabilization is. So there's, there's trade-offs. Um, personally, I prefer and recommend everybody to do it as optically possible and as native as possible uh, when you're doing ultra telephoto stuff and then relying on pixel to pixel versus something like uh, the adapters um, just because you get generally a better result optically. Um, but pixel to pixel is also not that bad at all, especially if you know, you're going to be doing something like 4K pixel to pixel, but then your output's really only going to be 1080 for the end deliverable. You still get to do down sampling in your software. So yeah, uh, it's definitely not an easy or simple kind of conversation. So uh, let's see here. Trinimedia 135 f1.8 would complete the series. Uh, we've definitely heard that and definitely passed it on. Uh, I, I am a fan of 135 millimeters, uh, or the, the traditional true portrait lens. Um, Joe says prime versus zoom is tough. It completely depends on the situation. And if I have time for lens swaps, uh, primes are obviously better optically, but lack the versatility. So this is, this is one of the things that I actually, I wanted to talk about today when it comes to optics with, especially in our S series, because it's the, their newer designs, newer optic designs. But for those that have been around in the industry long enough, you know, that the common thought process was that prime lenses will be much sharper and have better contrast, less vignetting, well, kind of, than traditional zoom lenses. So if you took, say, like a 24 millimeter f1.4 and put it up against, or let's make this super easy. If you went with a 24 millimeter f2.8 and put it up against a 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8, and we'll say this is back 10, 15 years ago, you'd probably be right. The zoom lens is probably sharper most likely it has better contrast. Uh, and then other things like they would typically focus faster because there's less elements to work with. And they're traditionally, they were more simplified optic paths and designs. But what's happened over the last couple of years is some pretty heavy, you know, kind of shifting in optic design. When we look at like the Lumix series uh, as a good example, our 24 to 70 f 2.8, or if you look in the micro four thirds realm at our 10 to 25 and 25 to 50, it's not really the same story anymore that a zoom lens is not as sharp or not as, you know, contrasty or as good as a prime lens anymore. 
the manufacturing techniques and the optics and materials that are available to many manufacturers, especially some of the stuff that we've developed, really start to blur those lines these days. So you can get ultra premium lenses that are designed to basically be a set of primes and end up actually being infinitely more flexible than traditionally with a set of primes for sharpness, if that's what your primary, you know, kind of target is for design. Um, that's not to say that it's always the case. Um, you know, when we look at our F1.8 series, they are clearly sharper, faster, you know, better breathing controlled than most of the zoom lenses out there that you can find in full frame mirrorless cameras. Um, but they, they do require that being, you know, you have to change lenses if you want to change your focal length. So it does become a bit of that, you know, do you want ultra quick, you know, sharpness and stuff like that? Or do you want versatility in your general kit with the caveat that premium modern day lenses are usually indistinguishable from the traditional logic that primes are just blanket, always sharper and better uh, than zoom lenses or better optically. I think it was, it was as it was put. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time these days now. And actually I want to talk, I have my S5 hooked up because I want to talk about some of the tech that we've put in our lenses that actually kind of exemplifies that. Um, let's see here. Uh, fully transitioning to L from MFT seems to take a bit of time. Thoughts in macro primes, uh, super tellies and more affordable compact F2 to 2.8 primes. I want to complete this soon. So yeah, this, this is part of, you know, kind of a spurred reason why I've wanted to update our conversation about, you know, prime uh, lenses in general in the micro four thirds and in the S mount world, because there are a lot of people that want to go to full frame and you want to stay within the brand. So you want to go up into our S series cameras, but you do need to start looking at, you know, basically rebuilding some of the lens options that you have. And the all mount Alliance is specifically designed because of that thought process. You know, you want to go into a system. We looked at the available mounts that we wanted to work with or design and found that the L mount offered probably the best balance across the board of lens availability and being able to tool up right away for development and, and availability to actually all of you who are looking at these lenses. And where that basically, you know, really kind of comes into play is, you know, when we look at, and I'll refocus this out here, uh, when we look at some of the optics that are available, you know, we've got tons of different lenses from different manufacturers. You've got Sigma, you've got Leica, Panasonic, now DJI is part of the Elmat Alliance. Um, I think there's a couple of, uh, Lights is also part of the Elmat Alliance. So you've got tons of different options. And the thing about it is that modern day today, you don't have to look at Sigma L mount lenses on the Panasonic system as quote unquote third party lenses anymore. They can be considered native mount because they are designed for the actual L mount. It is a standardization on the mount system and the communications that's required for the systems to work between Leica, Sigma and Panasonic, and then now the additional partners. So when it comes to lens availability, just because Lumix doesn't make a macro per se, you know, like we, we don't have a macro lens in the S series. So in L mount natively, well, there is one available from Sigma. Sigma makes the, the, uh, one of, where is it? The 105 millimeter is the one that Sigma makes. And I love using this lens. This lens is a super fun one to work with on the S series cameras. I use it on my S5 all the time. So you've got really solid options that are already available and they're already pretty cost effective for getting into the system. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that we'll never make a, a zoom or a uh, macro lens. Just means that as of right now, if you're looking for a macro lens, you've got some options available. And I think even Leica makes a macro lens as well. So there are some available. When it comes to super telephotos, again, Sigma also makes, like I think it's a 150 to 600 for the L mount. They make a 100 to 400 for the L mount as well. So they are there. They do exist. And then, you know, obviously if you want ultra tiny lenses or you want something that maybe is a little more compact, you don't necessarily need ultra fast for like 1.4 or 1.8. You've got the 2.8 series that pair up beautifully with our cameras. 
So the system does exist. I think it's just a matter of switching some of that traditional logic that we've had that if you want the best experience, you have to stick with the brand. And while that is true in certain cases, there are things that we build in with our lenses that are outside of, say, like the normal specifications. So things like um, the electronic parfocal, focus breathing control, because we do that optically with our lenses. While there are some of those differences there, you do have lenses that you really don't need to worry about or consider them a third-party lens for the lens mount. They are first-party manufacturers. Um, and truthfully, I mix them. I have both. I, I have Obviously, I have all of our L-mount systems. I have some of the Sigma lenses as well that I've personally purchased um, because it's a lens that we don't make. So I've got it. So yeah, there's, there's tons out there for it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is there a supply shortage regarding the nine millimeter lens in Europe? Pre-ordered mine August 1st, but still no word about the timeline or when it's supposed to arrive. I don't know of any supply shortages. Um, I had read some article that someone supposedly said something about it at some trade show. Shows you how legit or how much I pay attention to that kind of stuff. Uh, but from my, my knowledge, the lens has been very popular, at least here in the United States, the lens has been incredibly popular. So, um, I'm not surprised that there are back orders on it. Uh, but yeah, as far as Europe goes, I'm honestly not sure, uh, since partially it's not a region that I cover. So yeah, um, you have to check with the local team there. Um, and that, that's going to go pretty much the same thing with our team in Canada, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, Marlene. Uh, I think I pronounced that right. Um, but yeah, I know in the U.S. they are they are trickling out. Um, sometimes it also just depends on the dealer that you order it from, whether or not they ordered enough uh, to cover demand uh, for them. So yeah. Dave says, I like standard 24 to 70 equivalent lenses for general purpose work and primes for more specific work like landscape, macro, and portrait. Good primes tend to have better image quality. Yeah, in some cases they do. It, it, again, like I said before, it kind of depends on what you're actually looking for in some of the lenses. But uh, let's see here. Uh, Max says, hopefully we get more MFT glass with declickable aperture rings in the future. As far as I know, there's only the 10 to 25 and 25 to 50 right now, which are very nice, but pretty expensive. Yeah, so... As far as the declicked aperture rings, um, you know, that's the, that's a setup that is going to be very polarizing for it really is going to be about a 50 50 split as to people that love it and people that utterly hate it. Personally, I'm someone that actually likes the kind of setup like this where I can do a click and then I can be declicked and then I can just click it and end up having my click. It would help if I did the right one. So. For me, well, I, I love our 10 to 25 and our 25 to 50. They're beautifully sharp. And in my opinion, they are worth every single dollar that we've we've set for them, that we charge for them. Um, but there's a lot of, I think, people out there that are turned off by the fact that there's no indented aperture stops because you can very easily miss the point you're going for. Um, if you're someone that's grown up shooting in film and you may have been used to using some of these older lenses... They have clicked apertures, mainly because they were designed for photography. Uh, but in the video side, yeah, I can definitely see why some people would like or prefer to have um, de-clicked or the, the the ability to de-click a lens if you would like. Um, but as far as if there are any new lenses like that coming out, I honestly don't know. Um, I, we, we take all of that kind of into consideration, and it just depends on what optic and focal range are coming out and whether or not they're designed primarily for video users or they're designed for hybrid or stills users. Uh, let's see here. Keith says, completely off topic, asking video experts, uh, what do you folks use to make 4K Blu-rays for con uh, customer playback with compatible TVs? Yeah, that's definitely a question for the community. Um, I can't remember the last time I had to make a Blu-ray. Um, but I know that there is software and I think things like Final Cut can output that stuff for you or at least gives you the option for it for compressor i think uh any advice on using the leica sumalux 15 millimeter f1.7 with a matte box um it's a bit of a small lens so most matte boxes you're probably seeing run into the issue where like the opening for the matte box is this big and the lens is only like that big so you run into some of the how do you fill that gap area 
Um, probably the, the biggest thing I'd probably say for it is pick yourself up some step rings. Um, luckily with a 15 millimeter, uh, lens, so you're about a 30 millimeter field of view. You can, you can push those step rings out relatively far. Um, and you're not going to run into vignetting on the lens. So that can get you to where at least you can get to a kind of relatively more standardized, um, filter ring size to set the lens into a matte box and have the, the masking around the sides for light stray. Um, that's probably what I would suggest. Um, otherwise you could totally do this the way that I know I've done it before, which is just literally get some cloth and tape and make it work. Um, I know that that doesn't necessarily look the most professional, but it gets the job done. Uh, let's see here. FC, I used to get UV filters when buying new lenses to prevent dust, but it can't be avoided. How does dust affect captured images? I notice dust affect more at smaller apertures like F22. Yes, so, um, dust in a lens, for the most part, the vast majority of use cases, you're probably never really going to see any kind of effects from it unless it is really, really bad. Um, and when you're looking at it, at an artifact on an image, it's usually going to be something like a black blob or sh a shadowed blob on the image. That's usually not something in the lens. That is almost always going to be something on the sensor glass, the cover glass. Uh, if you can define the edges of the dust spot, you are very, very close to the actual sensor plane because it's going to be closer to where the focused light is from the, the, the lens. Um, Dust in lenses, where you're going to see it most often, is going to be in lowered contrast by comparison, uh, or situations where you have like big bright bokeh balls and you see some some stuff in them. Uh, as far as you know, things like you know, kind of avoiding it and preventing it. Um, I actually, I I don't use UV filters on my on my lenses at all. Um, and I have paid the price for it, honestly. Uh, it, I used to use UV filters, very high-end ones. Um, but I always found that I ended up having to clean those filters more and more. Uh, and they ended up actually being super, like, attractive to dust. Uh, because as you clean them more and more and you start, you know, using cleaning solutions or wiping off coatings and stuff like that over time or altering the coating effect. Um, I always found it that it actually ended up causing more problems. I'd get ghosting and stuff like that, unless you are buying ultra high-end clear filters, not UV filters. Um, since typically you, you don't need UV filters for modern digital cameras. Um, the only other thing is that typically I make sure that when I come back from a shoot, uh, or if I come back from traveling with my cameras and lenses, I give them a good clean down. Um, you know, just a simple simple brush and some, you know, uh, one of those rocket blower kind of things, or they're not rocket blowers anymore, but the air blowers. Uh, and I just, I just go through and I maintain my equipment that way. Um, the other thing is making sure that you are always having well-fitting caps on the back to minimize that dust. Um, that's always kind of really done it for me, but lenses that are listed as weather resistant, uh, or sealed in some cases, we don't call anything weather sealed anymore. Um, it's always weather resistant. Um, that means that the front should also be protective from any kind of dust incursion. Uh, zoom lenses that extend out, yeah, theoretically you have a little bit more of a higher chance of pulling dust in that way if it's ultra fine particles. Uh, but for the most part, usually you probably don't need to worry too much about that. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a tangent, I think from your question, but yeah, any kind of dust you're going to notice in a lens or on a sensor is going to come in usually at st more stop down apertures because you're focusing that light down more. So, uh, let's see here. Scholarhead says, is there any way to loose, uh, to loose the 24 to 105 zoom ring? It could be the perfect video lens, but zooming is super hard. Uh, and more IS lenses coming. I, uh, there's not any way to, to loosen the zoom ring on the 24 to 105. Um, it's, it's basically dampened to the point that it's, it's designed to so that it, you know, you minimize lens creep, lens creep. Cause there's always, there's always a balance that lenses have to take between how much, 
how tight do you make the rings so that when you hold the lens down or if it's, you know, you're picking it up out of a bag and the lens doesn't extend. That's why a lot of lenses are starting to come with locks built in onto them. Um, but yeah, so, and, and I wouldn't, I, I truthfully, I would not mess with it. Um, if you do go in there and try to change some stuff, obviously that voids the warranty, um, because it's altering the product. Uh, but you know, you, you typically, if you're trying to do zooms with it for video, one of the things that I can recommend is make sure you've got the thing set up on rails and use a follow focus to do the zoom. Um, that can help. Because at that point, you're not doing this with your hand. You're using a, a, a focus ring. That, or what, what would normally be a focus ring, using it as a zoom controller. Um, we've had great success with that, using the um, things like the Crozeal Zoomer uh, for controlling zoom on our, our 70 to 300 when we're demoing the box cameras. Um, because that allows you to, to con controllably make the zoom in a smooth step without having to try to handheld kind of overcome any kind of, you know, torque that's needed to do it. So Dave says, uh, I like good, I like good telephoto, uh, zoom lenses for wildlife, like the 100 to 400 lens as it's more versatile as animals move with primes. Uh, you may have to move closer for the way to get shot. Very true. Uh, ha says uh, great topic today as usual, but why FH, why FHS could it be? Oh, okay. I, I know what the acronym is. Why FHS could it be that with uh, within the Alliance Zooms do have opposite zoom directions? Sigma. Don't understand that. Uh, the, the zoom direction is a brand thing. Um, and truthfully, no matter what is chosen, it's always going to be wrong to somebody else. Um, it's kind of like flip screens, tilt screens. You know, the S1H and the GH6 have you know, some really awesome rear, rear screen designs, but there's always, you know, some things that people would want better or they want something going a different direction. Um, yeah, zoom direction. Um, you, you would have a monumental, uh, shift if every single manufacturer picked a, a direction for zoom. Um, but yeah, some of that stuff, it's just a matter of what, what the initial intent was when lenses were designed. As far as I know, Sigma lenses have, um, had the opposite direction of ours for zoom ring, um, ever since the inception of the brand. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to when the brands were first started, it was probably what the most common, uh, or popular lens design or mount was at that time. Um, so it's, it's all speculation in my opinion, truthfully, um, it, it, if you're working with different lenses, you've probably had to just get yourself used to it. Um, I know myself jumping between like, I have a Sigma 24 to 70 2.8. I've got the macro lens. I've got the mostly prime lenses. I've just gotten used to it that I know when I put that lens on, that's just the direction I'm going. Um, tends to not really cause me too much of an issue, uh, in the field, but let's see here. Uh, Martin, I have both the 12 millimeter F1.4 and the 10 to 25 F1.7. It seems to me that the 10 to 25 has more shallow depth of field when compared to the 12 millimeter at 1.4. Maybe it has something to do with sharpness. I, some of that can also just come down to the fact that the 10 to 25, uh, that series of lenses is much, much newer and it is a zoom lens. So zoom lenses versus prime lenses, you do also find some differences there. Um, you start looking at because the 10 to 25 is designed very heavily as a video forward lens, that does not mean that it's a bad stills lens. It's an awesome stills lens. Um, but you start looking at what is the actual transmission of light through that lens. So what is the T stop instead of the F stop off the top of my head? I do not know what the T stops are between the 10 to 25 and the 12 millimeter and what they are at the different uh, ranges. Um, but that could be also why you're seeing maybe a little bit of a difference between the two. Um, 1.7 to F1.4 is also not a huge difference in depth of field. Um, so some of it can just be the, what you're seeing is that the 10 to 25 is a much newer optic design. Um, it's much better coatings because they're newer and yeah, it just, it ha it does have better light transmission characteristics than some of the older lenses that much. I do know, uh, let's hear it in the follow-up. Uh, 
is it normal that the lens is making some scratching noises when zooming from 10 to 15? It doesn't uh, do it when zooming out. I, the samples that I've had, um, though with a big asterisk, are very early samples, do not have any of that. Um, if it is something that you are concerned about, definitely take a look at uh, service and have them take a look at it. Um, that's usually the first thing I would recommend. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 uh, Martin says, uh, I also avoid it making that sound if I apply slight pressure to the, pressure to the right side, turning the ring. Something in center of repair, will it will it uh, break your lens? Uh, if there is ever anything that you ever get concerned about on your lenses, making noises, things like that, always contact service. Um, don't don't think that you know that there's there's necessarily anything wrong with it. But if you're ever concerned, that's why a service department is there. Um, you know, if something's making a noise and it doesn't sound right, yeah, you would want to get it checked out. Um, is it going to be something that hurts your lens? I would have no way to tell. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to say one way or another because I don't have the lens. I'm not, you know, kind of known enough in the, you know, engineering of how that lens is put together. Um, but yeah, if there are ever any questions, you should always reach out and, and, you know, kind of get, get someone to take a look at it. Um, I know in some regions that's easier than others, but you know, that's just usually the process I would recommend. Uh, Michael says, I must say, the S5 is pretty amazing with its ProRes RAW recording to Atomos. Yes, it is. Um, Press too early. Just recorded a music video with the S5, Atomos, and the Sigma 16 to 28, and Sigma 24 to 70. Amazing results. Very cool. Uh, let's see here. D Creative, will the S1.8 lenses continue to expand over the 85 millimeter? I, I honestly don't know. I don't have an answer if. Um, you know, what, what the next phase would be or the next series or step would be for the lenses. Um, but know that, you know, obviously if we are going to expand anything in that range, you would of course know. We would always make us make a statement either, you know, at a, at an announcement, we would always talk about it here if something does get announced. Um, but yeah, it, that's one of the things we've seen a lot of people asking about 135, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, we know that people want other focal lengths and right now it usually just comes down to what lens is the next or the right, the most correct, you know, to kind of move forward with on the next steps. Uh, let's see here. Jackson says, would Lumix consider a lower megapixel super 35 L mount camera geared towards video? Uh, I believe our director, uh, Yamane son has pointed out that we don't have any plans for making a, an APS-C or a super 35 L mount camera. Um, full frame for us is the L mount. If you want a crop censored camera, that's where the micro four thirds realm is. Um, super 35 is just too much of an overlap with where our micro four thirds development is and can go versus where the full frame is. Um, as it sits already, the GH6 still does outperform a vast number of APS-C sensors out there for things like dynamic range, rolling shutter, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, at this point, um, from my reading of the interviews that Yamane Sun has provided, some of the other teams have, have provided, uh, Super 35 and L-Mount from us is not really something that's on the books to be planned for. Uh, let's see here. Michael says, 135, uh, 135 millimeter on the roadmap. No, we've just gotten a lot of people asking questions about it. So there is no roadmap provided for anything else than what we've announced already. So um yeah let's see here fc uh is there a spec for curvature barrel versus pin cushion when buying wide angle lenses i notice when using cheap wide lenses the model tends to complain that the camera adds a few pounds so yeah i don't know of any specific like actual kind of benchmarked you know kind of measurement for this um you would go to companies like dxo mark and uh at least that's the one i've used in the past to show like what is the curvature look like on a lens? What's the distortion look? I think lens tip also does um, this as well. Uh, typically ultra wide lenses are going to have more distortion, especially when you get closer. If you're working with a model or you're photographing any kind of people, typically if you're trying to do portraiture, so three quarters, you know, from mid chest up, or that's not three quarter, that's a headshot, uh, or even, even doing a three quarter shot, 
I stay as far away from wide angle lenses as I possibly can. Wide angle lenses tend to make the face look more squished and full. Uh, super telephotos make the face look thin and tall. Um, that 135 millimeter, like anywhere between 85 to 135 is about where distortion is kind of normalized, uh, for facial features and portraiture. There's a lot of things that you can see online, like GIFs and stuff or GIFs, depending on how you want to pronounce that, uh, where you'll actually see them go through the focal length by moving and trying to keep the subject in the same position. Um, wider angle lenses, yeah, typically are not a great thing to do headshots with. Um, usually you want to back yourself up and try to, um, you just give yourself more distance there. Um, come on, we're going to hide user on this channel. Uh, so yes, um, let's hear Jake says I had a great, I had great service when the 10 to 25 millimeter back of the lens got loose. It's a problem with early batches. I, I don't believe that was a problem, um, with early batch, but I'm glad you had good service uh, with them. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Andy says, could something like a 35 to 100 F2 be done? That would be pretty interesting. I mean, I know 2.8, uh, I know the 2.8, it's amazing, low aperture would be pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible. Uh, nothing optically is impossible for the most part. Uh, it's a matter of you know, kind of physics at that point. How big is a lens gonna be? To cover that kind of range with a faster aperture, how is it designed? What kind of uh, housing do you set it up as? Is it going to be a Leica series? Is it going to be a general series lens? Um, and that kind of goes into one of the other points that I wanted to kind of bring up is that there are always tiers of lenses that are available within different brands, right? So within the Panasonic world of optics, we have obviously Micro Four Thirds and then we have our L mount series. So in the Micro Four Thirds realm, as many people are aware, we have our Lumix G lenses, which are, consider them like general lenses. And I use general in quotes for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. And then we have our Leica series lenses, which would be our top tier. Um, and there's a lot of spec that goes behind a lens that can achieve the Leica branding, as well as in the S series, the Leica certifications in that mount. So when you're looking at these different tiers of lenses, you can keep a couple things in mind when you're deciding like, okay, which series do I want to go with? Because we have examples of multiple focal lengths within the same style. So you have the 25 millimeter F 1.7, and then you have the 25 millimeter F 1.4. That's a Leica. They're the, both the same focal length. Yeah. The apertures are a bit different between the two, but there's also a cost difference between them. The Leica version is more expensive. And the F1.7 is typically, it's it's designed more as a lens that's super budget friendly. So something that you can just throw in the bag if it's like a first lens you want to get. And it's going to give you really good results for a 50 millimeter, you know, kind of walk around lens. So if you're looking between these two and you're trying to figure out, well, which 50 millimeter should I go with? One of the first things that I recommend to people is what's in the rest of your bag? Do you already have like a series lenses in micro four thirds or do you work more with things like R12 to 35 or 35 to 100 or even some of the others, you know, 45 to 200 or 100 to 300, depending on the series that you work in, that's usually a, a, a relatively good indication of maybe which lens you want to go with next, unless you want to purposely break into our top tier lenses. And that, that 15 millimeter, the 25 millimeter, they're great ways to get into that category. When you do get into our Leica series lens, especially in the micro four thirds platform, since it's got the widest range available to date, you're going to notice a couple of things that really shine through with that series that separate it from lenses like the 25 1.7. The Leica series are designed to have similar color and contrast response across the whole series. What that means is the 25 millimeter, the 12 millimeter, the 15, the 42.5 noctocron, the, even the zoom lenses, they're going to give you a very similar look out of the lens because lenses do have defined looks between them. Even if they're the same focal length, same aperture, same everything, they have a look in them because of the way that the lenses are coated, the optic designs, how they're designed to handle things like bokeh. 
So when you look at our Leica series, that's going to be our, our series generation of these lenses have a very specific look. You get a very specific style of contrast out of them. You get a very specific style of, you know, micro contrast. The color reproduction is shifted slightly with those lenses compared to general lenses. And that carries to the same with the S series cameras. When you look at the S series cameras, and ironically, I didn't bring over one of my, oh no, I did. Um, when you look at the S series cameras, you'll see that we have two versions. We have the S series, and then we have the S Pro series. So our S Pro series lenses are all designed and certified by Leica. So what that means is if you're looking between, say, our 50 millimeter F1.8 versus the 50 millimeter F1.4, you're going to get a very different image out of the two of them. Yeah, depth of field might not be that big of a difference. And for some people, you may not really actually notice some of the subtle differences between them. But if you shoot them side by side, you'll see that the color tones are different on the 51.4 than they are on the 51.8. Is it better? That's up for you to decide because it depends on what your kind of styling is for lenses. Uh, or do you want something that is, you know, kind of more, I guess, utilitarian would be a good way to put it, or pragmatic. We we typically make very pragmatic products in the series. Uh, so yeah, with, with the top tier, and that's always going to be our premium tier of lenses, is going to be the Leica, you know, either co-branded or the Leica certified lenses. You know that when you work with one of those lenses in that series, you're going to have very similar look to your images across the board, which means when you go into the editing bay uh, or when you go into Lightroom and things like that, the tone responses are going to be very similar. When you work out of those two separate, uh, you know, kind of series, if you work with an S Pro lens and then you work with a standard S lens, you may notice that certain things may be slightly shifted between them. So skin tone might be slightly shifted between them directly out of the camera because of the optics and the design that the, you know, S Pro series was designed to and the spec that we've, you know, kind of set up for what is classified as a Leica certified lens. Um, yeah. Uh, Chris says, shooting my first documentary, this journey will start in my hometown of Alabama and will take me to Normandy, France. We'll shoot on the BS1H and S1H. What lenses would you recommend? Boy, is that a loaded question. Um, it's going to depend, uh, it, depending on what kind of, of filming you're doing, if you're doing landscape, you know, kind of overview shots, old, you know, wide angle lenses are your friend there. Um, I'm a big fan of the 16 to 35, um, just cause I like that lens. Yes, it's an F4, but I love that lens. I love mixing that between my, uh, full spectrum camera as well as my S5. I think it's just an awesome lens. Uh, the 24 to 70 can be a really good option. This is maybe where, especially if you're doing something where you're going to have multiple, you know, camera angles and takes and stuff, probably try to stick to a single series of lens. Um, and in that case, I, I truthfully, I'd recommend, you know, looking at the S pro series for it. Yeah. It's more expensive and there's no way around that. Um, but that can get you a really solid option. If you want zooms, if you're looking at prime lenses, then a full set of the F 1.8 series and you should be, you should be golden at that point. Maybe you need a longer lens in 85, but for the most part, the full F 1.8 series, especially if you're using something like the BS one H and if you're working on a gimbal, that could be a huge time saver for you, uh, in the long run. Uh, caption says, I asked this while ago on another live, um, and you were to get back to me. Any word on DR boost on the DR boost mode on the GH six and pro is raw. How is it capable of merging two ISOs on bear? Uh, so ProRes RAW is, is done in the recorder. So it's done on the Atomos. Um, the dynamic range boost functionality happens before that. The, the two signals are coming in before at the, the converter and then they're compiled to one image and then they're sent. So that's how it's done. Um, it's fairly similar to what's being done on, you know, things like Ari and some of the others that use a similar style of uh, technology for their kind of dual range or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it, it's not uncommon in the industry for the way that works, especially to capture something like ProRes RAW, because remember ProRes RAW is still compressed RAW. Um, that system's happening well before 
the actual conversion and the, the file creation to be sent over. So hopefully that gives you some answer. More than that, I, I haven't been able to get you know more clarity from that one. Uh, let's see here. Why not medium format? That would be interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, Martin says on GH6, uh, the second four thirds aspect ratio that is pixel to pixel, uh, as a significantly smaller FOV, it does say full sensor. Is it a bug? Can we get more four thirds full sensor modes? Uh, I would have to double check on that one. Uh, 4.4 versus 5.8 K. Uh, I honestly haven't looked enough into it to be able to give any kind of feedback on it, but yeah, I'll, I'll take a look, Martin. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you actually need F 1.2 or is 1.4 or even 1.8 enough for everybody? That is a very good question for everybody in the chat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for example, okay. Yeah. Uh, we know that one. Okay. So one of the other things that we wanted to talk about here, so I have my uh, 18 millimeter f1.8 attached to my S5 here, and one of the things that you know when we talk about before, I mentioned how the Lumix lenses have some extra little you know kind of fun built in with them, in capabilities that we have that aren't found in other lenses in the market. And that is, if I take this lens and I bring this focus all the way up to my 24 millimeter here, and I'm going to move this lens to give myself a better reference. There's a thing called being parfocal uh, when it comes to lenses. So for those that don't know, parfocal basically means, and those that do know, bear with me, I'm going to try to simplify this as best I can, and it may not be 100% correct. Parfocal means that, or no, I'm sorry, not parfocal. Focus breathing is what I'm talking about. Get it together, Sean. So focus breathing is something that we have very well controlled in the S series lenses and a number of the G series lenses as well. So what focus breathing is, for those that don't know, or if you come from the photography side of the background, focus breathing is when you focus from near to far and the actual field of view of the lens changes. It's called focus breathing because it makes it look like the scene is breathing. So you're moving in and out. Your field of view is changing. Some lenses traditionally, if you go back in, in history and look at some telephoto lenses, had really, really dramatic focus breathing. And some lenses today, not from the Lumix brand, have very severe indications and showing of focus breathing as you make that focus move through the plane. So from near to far, far to near. With our lenses, we made sure that, especially in lenses like the F1.8 series, we made sure that it's very well controlled with our system. So what that means is right now, if you look at the edge right here, so this bright edge on the edge of the 24 millimeter, you'll see that there's, there's this gap between the lens here. Well, if I come in here and I zoom this lens or focus this lens, sorry, if I shift my focus point and I go all the way back to say my GH6 sitting back there, you see how the 24 millimeter really doesn't change field of view. You still have, yes, your focus is changing, which is why it gets out of focus. So you're moving out of the plane. But if you look at the back where the grip is on my GH6 back here, you notice that the gap there, because of the distance from the subject, really isn't changing. And I, of course, as I just moved the camera. That is what's called controlled focus breathing. Now, there's a reason why we do it the way we do. We don't want to design a lens that has focus breathing in it and then have you go into software to have to reduce your field of view to the smallest field of view that that lens has through the focus breathing range which means your composition is no longer what you actually thought it was. Your 24 millimeter lens, your 18 millimeter lens is no longer an 18 millimeter lens when you have to do this in software post or through some feature that's added to correct for something that should be corrected for optically if possible. So what's cool is that the entire S series line of cameras or lenses is designed that way to minimize focus breathing as much as possible. Some lenses have a much better control than others. So if you look at things like the S pro series, they are incredibly well controlled. The S series lenses are also very, very well controlled to where there's a very minimal difference in your focus breathing, but you don't end up having to pay the premium on a lens like that for a feature that is very 
common in the video side of the world, but has some pretty solid photo benefits as well. If you're someone who likes to do focus and recompose for say like landscape work, or you're doing some sort of like say environmental landscape and you wanna have something close up, fo focused close up in front of the lens, you can make sure that when you focus there and then when you go focus on the background, the field of view is still gonna be the same. This also works incredibly well for things like post focus or anyone that wants to do focus stacking in an image. Focus stacking can get thrown off by the fact that a lens breathes as it moves through the focus because you're, you're physically letting the lens zoom through the focus range. That's why a lot of people, when you would do focus stacking, typically would be working on like rails where you're setting your focus point and then you are physically moving the camera through the field to shift where your focus plane is or you're moving the object. You can safely do that with our cameras and not really have to worry about that focus breathing imparting any kind of negative effect on the image that you want to capture. Uh, let's see here. Let's take a couple more questions here. Um, Damien says, uh, I have the Panasonic, the Panasonic Leica 25 millimeter F1.4 Mark II. Love the lens, but I'm curious, why are the aperture blades so loud when they open and close? And is there a way to prevent, um, prevent it besides live view? Um, I honestly haven't shot with the 24 1.4 that often. Um, and honestly that recently, so I'd have to double check. Um, Len, the sound that you get from aperture blades can be louder and you'll find varying different levels across the board uh, from from every brand. Because a lot of times it comes into, you know, like what the material is that the, the lens housing's made out of, uh, what style of aperture blades are used, are they rounded, are they more squared off, how many blades there are. Um, as far as, you know, just minimizing the noise, if it's something you just want to make it quieter, uh, if you use um, aperture priority and you work with maybe, uh, you know, kind of setting constant preview on, that can minimize it. Um, but if, if again, just like we were saying with some of the other stuff, if if it's something that ever you feel is maybe a concern, that's where you'd want to check with the uh, a local service uh, outlet for it. Noah says, my S5 all of a sudden refuses to output 4K. Any idea what would be causing that? Um... There can be a couple of things that causes that. Uh, if you, so this question came from Noah. Um, it depends, Noah. Are you using an external recorder or are you using an external monitor and display? Um, the other thing is if I go into the menus here for my S5, um, under the HDMI um, rec output, you're going to have the things like this is where you'll find your info display and output and stuff like that. On a camera like the S5, it has to take the information from the display to determine the output resolution for certain things. Uh, if you are recording to an external monitor, then it's going to go to whatever the closest is to it. So whatever it's identified as over HDMI. If some of the cameras have the ability to go in and you can tell the camera to downscale the output from 4K to 1080, the S5 doesn't have that, so most likely it's probably that the monitor or whatever you're using is telling the camera that it needs a 1080p or a you know a, not a 4K signal. Um, but if you get me more information, I can maybe help try to kind of isolate out uh, where that where that might be uh, in the chain. Uh, let's see here. Jake says, do you think when Lumix cameras are discontinued and not supported by the devs should become open source for modding? No. Uh, I, personally, this is a personal opinion. No, I don't think so. Um, because we do support the cameras still. Um, now, if you're talking like a decade old or well past when parts are ever available, it, it's truthfully not not my call. Um, I, I, I do believe that... There are challenges when it when it comes into to products as far as like, you know, changing the software and stuff like that, because it's it, it depends on how the camera was designed um, outside of that. It really, I mean, I, yeah, I, it's a toss up, honestly, 
Um, personally, I like tinkering with stuff, but I would never tinker with a camera, uh, firmware or software wise, because there's way too many risks there, uh, as far as breaking it. But I can fully understand people wanting to do that, to mod them and do things like that. Um, yeah, fortunately, any opinion outside of that, I have to keep to myself. So sorry, Jake. Uh, Martin says, when you compare full frame and MFT lenses and multiply the aperture by, uh, X2, do you get the same transmission? Some say if you have, you have to also multiply the ISO by four IE. So, okay. You're getting very dangerously close or if not actually fully into the whole, uh, equivalency conversation, which nobody gets right. I'm going to say this outright. Nobody gets it right. People always get it partially right. And then they'd stand on a hill and die on that hill because we all think what we say is correct. Um, truthfully, unless you are an optics engineer, unless you are designing this stuff and fully understand and, you know, understand how optics and all of that stuff works, um, I don't have an opinion on it. Um, it's well above my full understanding. All I know is that when I look through the lens, I get what I get. An aperture is constant between whatever the lens is because it's, Aperture value is a measured value of lens opening to the blades. So that that's a constant that doesn't change. An f2.8 lens is an f2.8 lens regardless of the format that it's for. Circle of coverage changes, depth of field changes, things like that. Um, and the truth is, things like ISO, those comparisons these days make no sense. Um, people saying that you have to just multiply by four or multiply by two or whatever. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't account for sensor architecture changes or generational changes or any of that kind of stuff. So I'm a big proponent of just ignore all of that stuff because one, it doesn't matter. Comparing a full frame lens to a uh, four thirds lens to an APS-C lens to a medium format lens. Why? You're not putting any of those lenses on the system that you're looking at anyway. So what, ma what difference does it matter? Um, it's, it's just so that people can put a number down somewhere and say like, oh, see, this is better. Or this is worse. It, it doesn't because it's that lens would never fit on the other camera body. That's the end of my rant on that. Sorry. So, yes, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is parfocal. So parfocal nature in a lens. And for those that are using the, uh, you know, they're interested in power zooms. This is something that's actually very kind of highly thought of when it comes to looking at a power zoom lens, especially for things where you're going to be doing say like stage performance or coverage cameras or, you know, kind of any, any broadcast style application. These are very commonly thought of. And then even in the cinema side, parfocal lenses have traditionally always been very expensive, very high tolerance lenses, and usually out of the reach of most people in the common world. And I consider all of us here the quote unquote common world because we don't have millions of dollars for a budget to go buy out, you know, an Optio lens or, you know, Ingenue or stuff like that every single day, right? So the basic thing here is that with parfocal lenses, when you think about what, what lenses traditionally do, when you zoom all the way in, you pick a focus point, you zoom all the way out, the vast majority of lenses in, in the in this world, lose their focus point after you zoom back out from telephoto. And that's a very common occurrence because for the most part, lenses that are designed in the mirrorless world and in SLRs, traditional, uh, traditionally have never needed those lenses to be parfocal. You were not recording video for the most part, and it's really kind of only a more modern thing in the last five to eight years that video has become more important in these cameras. Well, Parfocal nature of lenses is something that we've thought of very heavily with, especially the S series from the day one, but also a number of our G series lenses. And with what it means is that I can take a lens like our 50 to 200 millimeter lens. I can zoom it all the way down into, uh, you know, 200 millimeter. I can manually focus the lens, pick a focus point, and then I can zoom back out to 50 and my focus has not changed the plane. It hasn't changed a distance. This is something that with our camera, with our lenses, for the most part, we've designed to electronically assist this so that as I'm making that change, and as I zoom in and I focus and then zoom back out, the lens maintains that focus point. This is great, like I said, for power zoom lenses where you wanna be able to focus down on a stage by zooming in, focus and then zoom back out because you've got a coverage lens. 
but still have your focus there. You're not always having to constantly play with focus. But we do this a lot with our S series and our G series lenses, just inherently with the design. So you're, you don't have to always be worrying about this. Now there are multiple ways to do this. A lot of times optically, this is done in higher end cinema lenses and it brings a big cost. It brings a lot of weight and traditionally a much more complex optic design. With our systems, we've done this through software. We've done this through control of our focus motors and our zoom motors, things like that, so that we can have an electronically assisted parfocal nature to the lenses that is going to be incredibly very reliable. But, you know, you may find that a true mechanically parfocal lens, because that's mechanical, is always going to be 100% accurate every single time you do it, for the most part, as long as you maintain those lenses. But the, like our lenses for day-to-day -day use for everything that you may be using on a, on a production set, on a stage performance, or even just, you know, you're a wildlife photographer, you want to zoom all the way in, find that focus point and then zoom all the way back out so you can see what you're doing and then quickly snap back into focus or snap back into the focal range that you were looking for. That's where this really becomes kind of one of the things that we've kept in mind with the optic designs for any of the zooms on the S series and some of the uh, G series lenses as well. Uh, let's look, I've got time for two more questions basically. And then basically I'm kind of out of time for today's stream. Mark says, uh, people do get it right. Eh, okay. Practical use of equivalence isn't all that complicated. Uh, what do you mean transmission? Uh, shoot a full frame, 40 millimeter lens at F2, 20 millimeter micro lens at F2. The F aperture will be F4. So when I say transmission, uh, we're talking about T-stops, not aperture value. Aperture value is one thing. Light transmission or T-stops is a very different thing. Um, they are not interchangeable. And they don't always mean an F2 lens is not always the same light transmission as another lens. That's uh, one of the things that I was mentioning before. Um, let's see here. I think you get more light on an MFT 1.4 versus 2.8. That's better low light performance on MFT as long as the device is the same well. That's a whole other thing there. So, yeah. We're going to cycle away from the equivalency conversation because they never end well on uh, forums and in chat uh, chats there. If you want to continue the, um, MFT or the, uh, not MFT, the equivalency conversation, I highly encourage it outside of the, uh, platform, but yes. So your FC says, I noticed after installing a new firmware on my G9, my 14 to 140 lens became parfocal. So yeah, because we can control a lot of that stuff, we refined the algorithms for focusing. We refined the control that has, that we have on the lenses as we kind of go through the series. And as we update cameras, we update, you know, kind of profiles. That's one of the things that the DFD system provides is it it's profiling of the lenses for out of focus characteristics for, you know, uh, what, what the bokeh looks like, how the, how the focus ring is interacting with the zoom ring. Those are things that our system can do that most others don't because they don't profile. Well, I can't say that they don't profile their lenses because I don't know. But that's basically one of the things that kind of helps with our stuff is that we, we can update our systems over time and we often do. So lenses that have the precision needed to do things like the electronically assisted parfocal nature, um, lenses that are designed from day one for the uh, focus breathing control, those are very front of mind. And as we can improve them over the years, we will. As we can improve stabilization in lenses and cameras, we will. Uh, we did that with the S series. When the S1, uh, S1R, and the S1H first launched, they were only six and a half stops of stabilization out the, out of the at the day one initial launch. Less than a year later, we did seven and a half stops on those cameras when you use dual IS uh, compatible lenses. So those cameras gained an additional stop of stabilization through the time that we've refined the algorithms, came out with better lenses that have more precise, uh, you know, kind of uh, IS motors in them and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of where that one ended uh, before I go in too far down a tangent. But yes, uh, Trinity Media, great stream, as <laughs> great stream as usual. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, actually, I do have to... Um, I do have to actually call it for today. So thank you all so much uh, for the conversation, for the questions, for the back and forth. 
Um, these streams are so much fun. I love doing them. I love, you know, interacting with everybody, getting all of your, your, your feedback from everybody and, and the conversations that you all have with each other. It is awesome. Um, we're going to be live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the plan is we're actually going to have another creator interview, so you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, we will have a lot more um, information on that coming up. And then, uh, yeah, as we go through, uh, wow, it's already November. As we go through the rest of November, uh, we're going to have a lot more talking about uh, cameras, lenses, all this kind of stuff. Um, know that, you know, as we get closer to things like Black Friday and stuff like that, we're going to be probably trying to do more about, you know, what is the right camera to pick? What, you know, helping guide people in, you know, maybe looking at new cameras. So if you've got questions about lenses or cameras that you may be wanting to pick up over the holiday season, definitely have them ready because that's kind of going to be part of the conversations that we have over the next couple of weeks, just uh, point and shoots, full frame and S series cameras. So yeah. Outside of that, everybody, thank you again so much for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions. I hope everyone has an awesome rest of your day um, and an awesome weekend. And if you don't already, I would be remiss to not mention this. If you don't already, do us a favor. Help us out over on Instagram if you don't follow us already. We're very close to breaking 100,000 uh, followers on Instagram. That's kind of a, a, it's a fun milestone to hit. Uh, so if you're not over... Uh, on Instagram already following us, go check us out over there. If you're someone who likes to kill time and you just thumb through uh, TikTok or any of those platforms, we're on TikTok as well, Lumix USA. Uh, and if you like these streams, if you like the conversation and you know people that may like these uh, streams as well, give us a like, subscribe if you don't already. Um, and if you know someone who would love to join these conversations, let them know about it. Um, share the stream with them, invite them to future streams. Uh, I love this community and I think y'all are uh, just super awesome to keep hanging in there with us over these years. So with that again, everybody have a great weekend. Talk to you all next week. Later.